Um, there is a, a sweetness to the story that caught me by surprise because the entire town kind of comes together and they really help Lars, you know, through this process by yeah. adopting the doll as a real person. And the whole time I was waiting, you know, for, for someone, some asshole to be like, yeah. Lars, you're delusional, blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't happen. And that was very surprising. So was that what really endeared you to the script? Yeah, I think that the, I think that the script and Nancy as a writer, I think it's kind of a radical movie in the sense that it has like the guts to be nice <laughs> and to wear its heart on its sleeve and to be totally exposed um you know it's not it's not cynical at all you know and i but i do feel that it's realistic you know i think that uh, it's a matter of perception i think that in a situation like this where most of us would assume that things would go terribly awry uh I, when i was reading the script i kept waiting for somebody to burst his bubble or something bad to happen to her and uh you know, but but it doesn't, and I think that that's possible. You know, and I think that that uh, Nancy, the writer, thought it was more interesting to explore what would happen if you walked into a place that you were afraid, if, for a person who's afraid of being himself, which we all kind of are in some way. What happens if you walk into a, a world of total acceptance? You know, how would you handle that? And uh, it's uh, it's an, it's an interesting concept. I am from beyond. Listen, and all you desire will be yours. Welcome to Spider-Man and the Secret Wars. Prepare for battle. You're my mission. Finish it. Gives them with you to the end of the line. Welcome to Prattle World. I am your host, the ever amazing, ever spectacular Spider Dan. And in this podcast, I spotlight entertainment's best kept secrets that a mainstream audience may find boring. And welcome to Last Stop on the Hype Train, where guests help me tick off a popular, well regarded, or award winning film that has been much delayed on my bucket list. And I find out if it lives up to the hype. And today, this is the first podcast of 2024, and it's already getting weird, it's getting strange, it's getting indie, but this year is all about the patrons. They are choosing every single episode this year, minus the theme months, which I'm going to organize myself, but uh, 2024 is for the patrons, and this one is no different. I have a brand new voice, brand new guest. Blake Biles is here to talk about one of his favorite films, Lars and the Real Girl, and it has been chosen directly by my patrons for him to talk about, and then I'm going to see if it was worth the hype. Welcome to the show, Blake. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks, Spider Dan. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm excited about this. It's been a long time coming, the back and forths on Discord, and uh, we've landed on a great movie, thanks to your patrons, mm. and I'm, I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah, me too. Me too. I think it's going to be a, a very interesting a very interesting discussion. But yeah, this, this year is going to be very random, I think, and I think this is a good place to start because this is... A, quite a random film and i think a lot of people might be put off initially by the by the kind of the subject matter and what it's about right. yeah. uh, do you want to do you want to tell us a little bit what it's about before we get into the discussion yeah okay well i'll try <laughs> good luck good I, luck I, I mean you're right though in that this is a good place to start i mean for for the year for your films i i know spider dan from uh, the vhs strikes back and uh if anyone listens to that if you don't you should uh Spider-Man's infamous for his um, taste. Necromantic, was it? Uh, the first <laughs> one. The f I think that was the first one I picked. And uh, yeah. yeah. And, and I can't even live that. I'll never live that down, I don't think, now. And so I feel like this was kind of within your wheelhouse, um, for sure. I think it was pretty, pretty um, soft in comparison to some of them. But um, <laughs> yeah, so La Lars and the Real Girl, it is... How much do we want to say um, at the start? It's about a... Oh. A guy who's feeling a bit isolated. Uh, he has a family who are trying to kind of reach out to him and um, they're struggling to get him to connect um, with them and, and the world itself. Um, and until one day, uh, he brings a girlfriend 
to the house who's not from around those parts. I think they're probably like, in the, they're in the Midwest, aren't they? Uh, she's not from around those parts. Uh, she arrived via wooden cakes. Yes, she's um, a, one of the sex dolls that you order online. And hilarity ensues and a little bit of heart as well. Mm, I think that's a good way to describe it, I think. Um, but yeah, in the in the case makes it seem like it is some sort of necromantic sequel. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> like it's coming in a coffin. Uh, not quite, not quite. But um, but yeah, again, I, up front, I always talk about this particular format. Last time we talked about Goodfellas with Andy and why I didn't uh, watch that or I avoided watching that for so long. Um, with this film, it was it was definitely on my list. I was aware of it. Um, that and a few other kind of early kind of Ryan Gosling films, uh, like Half Nelson, I still want to watch. I've heard that's quite a good one of his and a few others as well. Um, he was kind of like the indie darling for quite a long time and slowly but surely became more more and more popular and got bigger and bigger films. You know, I love Drive. Drive's amazing as a, as a film. Um, with this, I think... For me, the reason I didn't go into it initially is I'm not, unlike you, Blake, I'm not a massive fan of kind of quirky indie films. You know, you kind of, um, uh, it's hard to hard to describe, I guess, but those kind of um, ones that are kind of a little bit twee and a little bit odd and a little bit kooky, a bit strange. Where do, where do you where do you sit with like Wes Anderson? Say like, I was going to say I was going to say Wes Anderson is probably the prime example of those kooky. I couldn't think yeah. of his name for the life of me. Then I I like him, but then again, it's kind of it's a weird kind of place for me to find. Like that, I think there's some weird kooky films out there with a lot of heart that I really enjoy, and I think I think I need to expose myself more to his filmography to get a better sense of him. I mean, I'm not I'm not wholly against these type of films because actually I think some of them work really well, but it's not something I would go out of my way to go, oh, I've got to watch, you know, this new Wes Anderson movie. I have to. Like my my friend Nathan is a big fan. He he does every time, you know, he will he'll be like, I have to watch this. And, and it's a very specific style. And I think there's a lot of people, there's a lot of imitators out there of that style. And I think Wes, the ones I have seen of Wes Anderson, I think they do work, but I think I've only seen maybe a couple. Um, so so I think that's one of the reasons. Again, like Lady Bird, when we did Lady Bird on the podcast, it was a very similar thing. I thought, oh, is it just going to be, you know, oh, we're kooky for the sake of being kooky? Or is there sure. something, is there something more to this? Is there, you know, like you said, a heart to it? And uh, and I feel like there are a lot of indie films out there, um, you know. You know, I like weird. Don't get me wrong. I like I sure. like I like weird. Um, <laughs> but with with that particular type of weird, sometimes it can put me off. I think another reason would be the the topic. I mean, uh, a man a man buying a sex doll. The sex doll industry and the people who buy sex dolls. There is a very stereotypical view of of the people who do that which is creepy, loner, you know, maybe misogynistic. You know, there's a guy in this film that makes a joke about, oh, a woman who doesn't talk, perfect, and I can have sex with her all the time whenever I want. You know, there's there's that there was that element where I was like, I don't know if, you know, this is going to go into that. I was like, I was like, it's unlikely to go into that kind of territory, but it's still a little bit off kilter. And I think as well, again, it's like I was saying earlier, like the finding the right time and mood. Like there's, there's certain films where I struggle... Um, if they're about like, like for me, I can watch a horror film, people getting chopped up to bits. That doesn't bother me. It doesn't upset me. It's just a thing. But when in things are about like real things and emotional things like depression or, you know, homelessness or, you know, financial struggles or, you know, abuse, you know, things like that, like those real dramas, I, I tend not to gravitate towards them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's part of this as well, where I was like, I don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm in the right mental headspace to to watch something like this but yeah. th those are my reasons um now i want you to tell me why i'm wrong blake <laughs> no i mean you you raised a good point there about uh, i resonate with what you say about trying to have the right time and space to deal with movies that deal with kind of real real things and the difficulty i think with a movie like lars and the real girl is it, it doesn't give you a lot just from looking at it on the cover like in the video store say uh, from memory the cover is lars and the real doll bianca um sitting on a bench and you know she's rigid and he's sitting there <laughs> He's he's sitting there and his um he he wears all these lovely kind of 
jumpers that you'd wear in the Midwest in the wintertime. And he's got a mustache. He looks not the kind of Ryan Gosling we know. Uh, yeah, you put on a lot, a lot of weight for this role as well. Yeah, a bit paunchy, a uh, bit drab looking. His skin's pale and a bit uh, stubble. He's got a mustache um, before mustaches were cool again. Um, and he's got a grin, like just like a kind of a innocent kind of grin, which is a bit unsettling. It was kind of, it would have been a few years after, say, one hour photo, you know, yes. with a similar, similar vibe where it's like Robin Williams, we know him, he's a lovable guy, and he looks a bit like, oh, that's Robin Williams, we know him. But then the twist is that he's actually really sinister. So to look at it in the video shop, you might think, oh, this is a bit, we oh, don't know about this. Mm. But pushing through that like to, to go past that kind of uh curio- the, the, the doubt and probably curiosity is actually just like a really lovely film like i was surprised by it because i i think i was similar to you and i kind of would give it a bit of a wide berth when i walked past it in the video shop and in another kind of uh plug of vhs strikes back it uh, uh i had the same reaction to it as i did with bad boy bubby in the um in the video shop when i was a kid I'd always walk past Bad Boy Bubby, the cover, and he's sitting there and he's like laughing, he's like cackling, and it's like, oh, he looks like he's having a fun time. But the more you look at it, it's like he looks a bit like he's in a prison or something like that in, a, uh, in an institution. So I was a bit like scared of it when I was a kid until I pushed through and watched it, and it was not what I thought it was in good ways and bad ways. Uh, but you have to listen, you, you have to, listen to the VHS uh, strikes back. If I, I will, I will link, I will link that podcast um, in the notes because uh, I mean, I I really enjoyed that film. I because I, it was already kind of on my list anyway. And when you brought it up, I was like, yeah, I should watch that. And again, I knew I knew mostly nothing about it. I knew that like Quentin Tarantino liked it, so I was like, it must have some merit, surely. Um, but yeah, it wasn't wasn't quite what I was expecting. But again, it was yeah, pushing through those first thirty yeah. bits or so was uh, was quite intense. Won't talk about it here because spoilers yeah, yeah. and yeah. maybe maybe not the right time of all podcasts that's right that. that's right so so a similar similar vibe where yeah i would give this cover a, a bit of a wide berth and then eventually i thought now check it out and you know it was actually i had not seen a lot of brian gosling films prior to that uh my mum would like rave about oh you must watch the notebook you must watch mm-hmm. the notebook again and I, I kind of just saw him as like a pretty boy kind of poster pin up kind of guy and it was, I think it was actually this film that made me think, oh, wow, this guy is good. He can really, yeah, he's really dedicating himself to this role. And he had some really great performances, like, you know, namely from him, but it's a really great supporting cast as well. So, yeah, I would say it's kind of like, you know, you mentioned the thing about the indie films and the twee for the sake of being twee, but no, like this has um very a big heart and it has like some really interesting messages. So, yeah, that, that would have been my recommendation for watching it was just to push past the cute that kind of mm. curiosity and and uh, be rewarded with a, a quite a rich um story with with this uh, it deals with again like i was talking about a lot of kind of mental health issues um so we have we have lars he's uh, a lonely guy he lives in the in the garage um he uh, across from his brother and, and his wife um and he's quite lonely he struggles at work he doesn't relate to people he gets frustrated he's uh he doesn't like being touched he's um Mm. abstaining from human contact because he feels that's gonna be painful or upsetting or problematic for him now they once they learn that he has the doll and he's he's treating her like a real person he's not recognizing that it that it's a doll he's um he's you know she doesn't speak english so he translates for her she's he goes oh she's she's in a wheelchair she's uh so i have to wheel around she's very religious so we have to sleep in separate rooms which i think is a very good way a very clever way of of getting away from the creepy angle or the that's right uh the just the disturbing angle or the you know the sex object angle of of the film i think that was a really very very simply done you know it's mid, it's the midwest fairly religious you know area in america so i th- i thought that that decision immediately kind of put me at ease i think within the yeah. film what what did you think of the so there's a lot of kind of criticism about the film in regards to indulging in delusions because they consider this 
a de- delusion to a point, some of the characters, uh, some of the people in the town. But the doctor says we need to indulge in the delusion. Now, mm. you know, some people are saying this is not realistic. This does not represent mental health. You know, this is not realistically what would happen in the real world. We wouldn't do this. What did you think to that kind of... Mm. I think some people even went so far as calling it a fantasy film. I mean, I mean, there is a level of... I mean, there's multiple levels of fantasy in this film. I can't really speak to how like realistic it is because, I mean, we just got to go along with the fact that, yeah, the doctor does this and then the whole town gets involved. I mean, that kind of is speaking in some ways to this kind of Midwest um, kind of culture, you know, the religious or like conservative, like um, the tribalism, like looking after one's own. That's a whole other thing. Um mm. But yeah, I think it was really interesting, actually, like I was saying before we started recording, I was really glad to have come back and watched this because, yeah, I haven't seen it in you know, over 10 years. Um, and since that time, um, I've been training in psychosocial studies and I'm training to be a psychotherapist. So I was actually able to look at this in, in a light I, I hadn't before, you know, or with more nuance, you know, and and I and I've read some I've read some of the the stuff about it. Um, and people, yeah, some people say like uh, he's delusional. Some people try and diagnose him as autistic and, and and different things like that. I found it really interesting the Patricia Clarkson role of the doctor, how she was very um, caring and like conscientious of what was going on here. The thing with like delusions and that, like people might say, like, oh, he uh, has psychosis or something like that, or he's autistic. But another way to look at it is that he's just been triggered by grief, right? So part of the backstory is his mother uh, died uh, giving birth to him, and that's something he's held on to. They he was left with his father who. Couldn't, didn't, couldn't handle the loss very well. And his older brother, just the two kids, the older brother left as soon as he could. He got it out of there. And so he was left with this like emotionally stunted father. The triggering thing being that now his brother is back with his wife and his wife's pregnant. And so I think it's the, the pregnancy element that's triggering this um, difficulty for Lars and kind of sets the, this whole thing in motion. And so the doctor um, sees, I think rightly, Bianca, the sex doll, as what we would call in the trade, uh, a transitional object. So children, they have their teddy, they have their blankie, the thing that helps them transition from that maternal, that really closely bound maternal relationship out into the world. And so we have these transitional objects. And so Bianca, the doctor, doesn't explicitly say, but I understand it from how she's operating, mm. is that Bianca is a way for him to process this recurrent grief. And then the other aspect of kind of psychotherapy that I, I witnessed in, in, in there was that the town operates as like a holding environment. So in a therapy setting, the room, you know, or how, how you do it uh, with your therapist, that's like the holding environment that the therapist helps to create so that you can bring out the stuff that you have been bottling up outside of that space and so yeah but for all the different criticisms that people have i just say i just think that there's lots of different ways to approach mental health and and the way that uh the doctor and in the town has done it is something i actually subscribe to uh, as a way of working through things um so yeah i really appreciated watching it again after all those years yeah, I mean, it it is it is heartwarming, you know. Again, it is it is a film. At the end of the day, it's not it's not a true story. And even if it was a true story, it's a depiction of that true story that may not entirely be true in itself. There is creative license, there is artistic license, and I think you know. Imagine if the whole world acted like this. Like, imagine if we we were all so open and 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 warm and welcoming and accepting of people's own kind of mental health issues, problems, struggles. You know, it's still it's still very taboo to this day to even talk about it or approach it in children, adults, 
you name it, and there's various issues and various problems. We're much more aware of it and much more um, kind of are able to maybe not diagnose necessarily, but a familiar, you know, someone who isn't trained could still maybe spot there is mm. not not a problem, but there is a, a situation, let's say, uh, with, you know, going on with somebody. They are having struggles or issues. Um, but, yeah, imagine, I mean, in, in, a, in a sense, yeah, I can see the kind of, the fantasy where they're coming from when they say it's a fantasy that the the whole world is warm and understanding and accepting i, I get that criticism but you know i also I, I also enjoyed thinking you know it could be you know there's possibility this this could be the way this could be the future you know this is you know for a, you know a, a closeted midwestern religious town can can turn their heads around on a, on a guy owning a sex doll mm, you know mm. why why can't we in the rest of the society and the rest of the world do that not do that so yeah it, it, i can understand the criticism from that aspect but i think within this particular story and the story they're telling i think it works i did have a a, a concern going in when all the people are like, oh, Bianca wants to help out at church. Bianca wants to read stories to kids. Bianca wants to do this. I went, oh, please don't take advantage of him. Please don't take advantage of this poor man who's struggling with his mental health. Like, mm. are, are they going to make him do all these jobs and make him do all these things? Uh, and and in fact, it's the it's kind of the opposite, really. It's to yeah. to, to get him out in the world and get him doing things. That's um, right. So yeah, I, I I thought that was fascinating. And then it got to a point where he why she's doing so much that he gets jealous that she's out and living a life and he's not. Yeah, well, well, and that's a perfect art of the exactly what I was saying about the transitional object mm. is that the the longer it goes along and the more the community bring him through Bianca it back into the community that they start, the more that happens, the more they kind of split up. And because mm. the, 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 Bianca's narrative was always through him. Like you said, you know, she uh, can't speak English. She's in a wheelchair. Uh, but then other people started saying that Bianca wants to do this. And he was like, oh, really? Like, like he's fully invested in it. So he, they start having arguments and that, but eventually she uh, gets ill and she dies. And that's that kind of cathartic release for him. Uh, going back to, Gosling's like acting it was really fantastic when you start first see him he's very um withdrawn his body language he's got picks even and as soon as Bianca's in the world like in, in his life he's up he, he's, he's like blossomed he's uh confident and there's a you know there's a really beautiful really poignant scene you know at the house party and he's a bit like they they both go to this like co-worker's birthday party and he's a little bit nervous or they're both a little bit nervous beforehand and he's giving you some advice on um you know just how to talk to people and the, the everyone's all kind of welcoming they're also the the, the the people in the party are a little bit nervous as well because they're all wanting to handle it sensitively and then they go in and they're chatting away and he kind of goes off and does something else and it, it culminates that scene culminates in Everyone's kind of dancing along, and some one of the one of the friends is uh, kind of uh, rocking Bianca in a wheelchair, and Lars was just there, like holding his hand out, like he's they're like they're in a waltz, and he's got his eyes mm. closed, and he's just like so. It's such an internal moment, like an unspoken moment. He's got his eyes closed, even so we can't see that, but just you can tell how blissfully happy he is. To be a part of it, you know, to belong, to feel enmeshed in it. Like, I don't know how much he's conscious of how much everyone is doing for him at that moment, but yeah, I just, I love that scene of that little moment where he's, he's back in, he was back in the tapestry of the community. Yeah. Like he, I mean, he's, he's already like a big part of the community. He goes to church and, you know, he, he's accepted. People know him. You know, he, ha he has a work. Like the doctor's like, is he functioning? Does he clean himself? Does he eat? And they're like, yeah, he's, you know, he can, he can mm. do all that. He looks after himself. It's just this particular thing. Um, and I think spe speaking of like, great performances i think emily mortimer is is fantastic in this as well and and again she's really trying she's really trying to bring him into the family and he kind of doesn't want to speak to her or is a bit distant or is like he's trying to like get away as 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 much as possible he's like i can't speak to you i can't be here i can't do that 
and he um and he's just trying to and she's trying her best to kind of bring him in invites him to breakfast you know bangs on his door and he's like oh i can't quite come today or i've got this or i've got to go to work i've got to do that and you know and she's trying to find ways to kind of bring him into the the family unit because he mm. he just lives outside and and his brother is very he's embarrassed straight away when this when bianca comes on the scene because it's the they're worried he's psychotic or dangerous or you know um you know there's something deeply wrong they can't afford to put him in an asylum or um you know a mental health facility um uh, or get psychiat psychiatric care and i love i love um i love the doctor's response to it as well is like you know people are going to laugh and he's like she's like yeah they will like big yeah. big big fucking deal do you want do you yeah. want your brother to be do you want your brother to be well or or do you want to just have you know be caring about what other people think we should we should talk about the brother actually even mm. of it one of the things that really struck me more this time is the way in which not in the movie but in the in this in our world how mm. people would stigmatize and pathologize Lars as being abnormal mm. watching the film the brother's more dysfunctional than Lars, really, yes, in a way, yes, is, right? Yes, like, absolutely. He's, he's so fine. He finds it so hard to communicate anything with Lars, you know, because you're right, Emily Mortimer is fantastic in it. And I love how she's the married in family member, you know, yeah. it's, uh, that she's the one kind of not on the outside, but she she she's the way that she's really working to bring Lars in mm. the family because they are the family, you know? It's not like, oh, he's your brother, you deal with it type of thing. Mm. Um, maybe because she knows her husband who's really <laughs> emotionally stunted and he cannot have any deep and meaningful conversation with uh, Lars. In fact, he's not getting like physically like anxious Hmm. When he asked him the same thing, and yeah, when he when you, like like you say, he really flips out when this all comes. And a, a, a quote that really stood out for me is he says, "Like, what will people think?" You know, and that's the thing that for him, he's socialized. He's more socialized than Lars, but actually, the so his socialization is kind of the problem hmm. because he's so thinking how it's going to look. Yeah, yeah. It really, really struck me more this time than it did the first time. <laughs> Yeah, like his his distance, even in his own marriage, is quite you know it's, it's quite you don't you again like Emily Mortimer says we've been wrapped up in the whole baby and and everything and doing that and we've forgotten about Lars, but but because and then when Lars is blossoming, their their relationship is kind of in the decline because mm. you know that they're, they're doing you know they're washing Bianca, they're you know bathing her, and they're like, why are we doing this? And we're like, you know, it's and she's trying to play it off like it's fun, you know, it's a yeah you know, yeah. Because this this doll is weighted like anatomically. It's not only am anatomically correct, but it's weighted in a in the way a human is. So it's it's it weighs like a human dead weight. Would. Yeah. yeah, dead weight exactly. So they're when they're bathing her, it's it's becoming quite difficult. And then again, they're just becoming more and more distant until he kind of has has a little bit of a breakthrough. And mm. and uh, and uh, I, I mean, we probably should have said spoilers up front, but yeah, the spoilers for this, as always in all my podcasts, there's always spoilers. Um, but uh, but yeah, the he has a breakthrough and and realizes that he kind of feels like he abandoned Lars and and left him in that emotionally stunted ho household and. And and that's why he's like this. So it's his fault that he's blaming him himself. For, yeah. And, and he's like, I left him in the garage. I let him live out there like a dog or something. And that's and that's his baggage. And that's what he's been holding yeah. on to. And and weirdly, Bianca actually has a positive effect not only on him, on Emily Mortimer, on on the town as a whole. Uh, this again, this this object, like you said, a transitional object. But it's a transitional object almost for the entire town. Yeah, yeah. It's like that thing, like when. When you're at the park and you meet like as someone who you know, you kind of know, or a stranger, and um, you kind of talk through, but like, you're there with your children, or you're there with the dog, and you talk through the dog, like, oh, how are you doing today? You know, it's it's Bianca was that way to kind of unify people until she she didn't wasn't needed anymore. Yeah, I I I, I like what you said about the decline. I, I felt really sad when the bathing Bianca and uh, the husband's like, oh, why are we why are we doing this? And she's kind of trying to bring it an olive branch, like laughing and being playful about it as a way for them to reconnect. But there was just that sticking point 
Mm. And yeah, I, I felt I felt a bit sad about Gus Gus's break breakdown, his breakthrough, because it was like he had this resistance. He had this resistance. What are people going to think? They're going to laugh until the point. Well, why are we doing this? Until the point where he's he yeah opens up like oh I I shouldn't have left him. We just came back and he went out into the garage, and then he's just has this little moment that he goes over to uh, his wife and like lays down on her lap like please like make it better i mean they they had to kind of wrap up that scene quite quickly but mm. i just i would have liked to have seen a little bit more growth from him from from that point because yeah all all of that proceeding is he, there's a little bit of projection there you know he's putting it on lars what are people going to think about lars people are going to laugh at lars but actually, he doesn't want to be seen to have done the things that he confesses in his breakdown, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he he doesn't want to be, and I think that's why he's not open to the the psychological evaluations and the and the therapy because you know it's it's going to be it's going to be his fault. It's, it's going to mm. be he's going to be blamed. Um, and I love that she, she the doctor frames the therapy sessions in a in a form that Bianca needs treatment. There's, that's right. Yeah, it's like this unknown disease or problem she has, and she has to have these treatments. She has to lay down for two hours once she's had the treatment, which is their mm -hmm. opportunity to have to have that uh, that kind of therapy session. And they're re and they're really wonderful. Um, yeah, Ryan Gosling, I think, is fantastic. Um, like you were saying, I think he absolutely nails the role. And like you said, he starts off in in one place and slowly but surely kind of comes out of his shell. But then he becomes you know, he becomes a little confused as as his kind of, like you said, he's transitioning away from Bianca psychologically into maybe fancying fancying the girl at work, um, That's right. and 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 he's he's torment, kind of conflicted by those feelings that you know this woman has brought so much to it. And this woman, see, even I'm doing it. I'm calling Bianca a woman now. So there you go. It, I, I'm convinced, um, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've transitioned to, to, and that's what they did on set apparently as well. They, the cast and the crew yeah. were speaking to Bianca and treating her as if she were alive, as if she was speaking. She had demands. She wanted a coffee. So want to go get her a coffee, you know, things like that's that, right. which I think definitely helped, probably helped Gosling as well, get into his kind of mindset and, and helped the town. And and I love that I love that jealousy kind of that comes out of him where it's like oh you're spending all this time at church when do we spend time together and then and then he and he's pulled up he's pulled up for his kind of misogyny his jealousy that you know she has a life of her own she can't just sit around waiting for you you know she she's she does she quite literally has a life of her own you know this this you know inanimate object has a life of its own and has again an effect on this entire town and and everybody um you know and they all and they all adore her and they're like you know she goes for haircuts she she goes for you know she models at the at the, at the you know the clothes store or uh, in the front window, yeah, yeah. In the front front window, I don't even know what you call this. You know, the where you buy clothes. I don't know what you, what you call it. <laughs> the fashion place, you know, where, whatever the words are. I, I, you can tell I don't shop for clothes often. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's it's really really fascinating. And Emily Mortimer is like you can just see her like struggling throughout the entire film, just trying to get some something from Lars, like you know, just trying to pull it pull it out of him. Uh, and that moment where you know. The, the realization for Lars that you, you don't realize what this town is doing for you. Everyone loves you. Everybody cares about you because of Bianca. They're doing all of this for Bianca, for you, to make you well, to make you feel welcome. And I, I, again, that was a wonderful, wonderful moment in the film as well. And because he was like, the stuff that he was saying, like, you know, um, it was like, it's so relatable because it's these worst fears that we have that we're going to be like unloved or um, unappreciated or just rejected, you know. Um, and when he's saying this, those types of things in that scene, it kind of feels like he doesn't believe it or he doesn't want to believe it, and he just needed something. He he was at that the, the precipice there, mm. right? Of of that for, of that transition and the, yeah the 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 kind of argument they have was the thing which is yeah we do it for you it was really that was the the kind of bridge that he needed to kind of come over a little bit more and yeah we haven't really mentioned his co-worker but mm. that was 
a bit of a precipitation. I think, yeah, like you say, he 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 was jealous of how Bianca was spending so much more time with the township. And uh, in parallel, he, there was this co-worker who they kind of had uh, some energies and sparks with. But then she started because he was a taken man. Uh, Miles was a taken man. She was starting to kind of pair off with this uh, other guy in the office, and you could see his with tinges of jealousy there. So I think those things worked in parallel to kind of help bridge that transition. And there was a really sweet moment where they went bowling. It was going to be the three of them because, you know, he he's, um, he, he, he wouldn't have gone out without Bianca, but then she was sick. And so he, he, he goes with just his co-worker and then they happen to run into some of his brother's workmates and they all join and there's a bit of a party kind of forms where they're all kind of having fun. And he's there. First, he thinks it's going to be uncomfortable because it's just gone from just his co-worker to these other people who... It's going to just be a bit more stressful, right? Sure. But then um, there's some small, like, some small moments where he kind of has like these little celebrations of like, oh yeah, I did well in the bowling, and he like, I think they like high five or yeah. something. He high fives one of the guys, and as you said earlier, he had a fear of like physical contact. Yeah. So that was a great little sign there of oh he was getting into it, and he's mm-hmm. amongst them. I think one of like the the other guys has like his arm over the chair that Lars was sitting in, but just being a part of like the pack, being a part mm. of the gang that mm. was um, like a sliver of a uh, sign for Lars, like, oh, this could be comfortable. I could get used to this a little bit. Yeah, like he's really enjoying it. And uh, I, it, what's interesting as well is you've got um, the 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 female co-worker, I can't remember the character's name, but she, she has a teddy bear on her desk and the other co-worker that he sits next to, the irritated one, has has action figures, which I thought was quite interesting because they they are very precious about them. They're very, you know, that they, they are worth, they have value to them, emotional or, you know, um, transactional or whatever. Um, and, you know, one of them gets hidden by the female co-worker because the guy's being dick. And he's like, you better give it me back. They're worth so much. How dare you do that? And then he hang the co-worker, the male co-worker that's not Lars, hangs the bear, like creates like a noose out of a cable, that's which right. is that's quite right. dark and disturbing. And that leads to one of my my favorite moments as well, is where uh, this was apparently improvised, is where Ryan Gosling performs CPR on the bear and brings it yeah. back to life. It's very Won- wonderful, wonderful little moment. Again, like just just magical, just kind of like a just wonderfully kind of magical and and her her reaction is quite genuine as well so i believe that 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 was, was a surprise yeah yeah yeah, yeah the, the charm that he had that he was capable of and the empathy that he was capable of yeah it was that was a great scene that one yeah i really really enjoyed that and um and yeah and and i love i love as well that when when bianca is getting sicker as the film goes on, she gets more and more ill. You can tell because they they make her look paler each time. Which yeah, I, thought, I read which that was, as well. Because I, I was like, I was like, she, I, and I noticed it. I was like, she's getting paler. She's mm. not, she's not looking well. I'm I'm concerned and like, and and the concern from the town grows as well because you know she's not breathing. She's unconscious. She's not responding. Emily Mortimer calls nine one one. That's and right. They, <laughs> like because she's like, Jesus, she's not breathing. I better call the call the doctor. And Gus Gus at a moment was like. Nine one one, really, um, and I, th- I think we've not really. I've, I think we talked about the kind of the psychological ramifications of the film and and what it has to say about those kind of uh, difficult mental problems that we all we all suffer one way or another. Um, but it's very funny as well. Like it's really humorous. Yeah. Like there's so much like, and it's it's not necessarily. At, I wouldn't say it's at Lars's expense. It's not. We're no. not laughing at him. But there, there's genuine moments of, of levity and humor which are. Are warm and funny and 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 again charming, uh, yeah. for lack of a better word. That's that's one of the highlights of it for me as well, actually, because like I say, you know, going into it, looking at the cover and that, the kind of the subject matter, there's a chance it's going to be crass and crude mm-hmm. and misogynistic, and they do a really good job at avoiding all of that. Um, you know, and there was there's that there's that scene. You mentioned uh, at uh, Gus's workplace, that's like a hardware shop or something yeah. like that. So it's the the boy is around, and that's the closest it gets. But they play it very well. You know, the, 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 the guy says, "I wish I had a woman who couldn't talk." You know, and but like it's kind of framed as that that's an antiquated yeah. way. You know, and and then and then like the, another guy 
pipes up and he's like, no, does she have a sister? You yeah. Know? Like, yeah, yeah. And it's kind of that's that's as blopey as it really gets. And, yeah, true, um, true. I, I, I think um yeah, the kind of sexual element is not really entertained in, in, in that way. And it's, I think it's for the better. Yeah, no, I agree. I think I think you you do away with all the kind of you know, there's. I'm going to talk a little bit about the sex doll industry. I went down a bit of a rabbit hole, a uh, very, very intriguing rabbit hole. That's, that's which a fascinating one. Yeah. It, it, it certainly is. I, I said to Mike the other day on uh, of genuine chit chat. I was like, if you spoke to somebody about the sex doll industry or did some kind of research into that, I think that'd be a a wonderful genuine chit chat episode. You know, if you yeah. spoke to someone who deals in them or or has one, or you know, that would be really, really fascinating episode. And again, would yeah. take away a lot of this stereotyping, a lot of the stigma. Um, yeah. That comes with it, but yeah, and and like you said, that guy, that guy who's you know initially like hoo, 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 you know misogynistic and stuff, he's at the funeral. Yeah, yeah. he's there. The, everybody's the whole town's there, and again, and and the ambulance is taking it seriously as well because they know about the situation, and right. and they're and they're not they're not going. Oh, you're wasting our time. We're going to have to charge you for this or anything like that. They, you know, they rush in. The doctors there. Everybody's taking it very seriously because Lars is taking it very seriously. The stakes yeah. are that we're taking it very seriously because we've we've become we love Bianca. We've we've gotten to a point where where we care about Lars and we care about, you know, again, an inanimate object. We are fully on board with this. And again, you know, there's there's films out there that do a very good job, like Toy Story, for example. It, you know, that's a bunch of inanimate objects, really, and you know, coming to life in a sense. You know, the and and we as human beings, we want to personify a lot of objects. Like we'll talk yeah. to our plants, or you know, um, you know, a, a little you know robot dog, or people have AI girlfriends now. It's a thing. You know, there's we want to personify technology or objects or things. You know, or give them names. You know, I th- I think that as as human beings, we will always do. And you know, your dog has a name, but you'll give him another seven nicknames. You know, and you know, That's you're right. aware of those type of things. So it makes it makes a lot of sense for me to to believe this and to and to buy into it and uh, and yeah and and by the end of the film you know it 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 comes to a, I think a satisfying open ended conclusion which, which uh, you know it left me and you know left me in a in a in a good in a good you know good space so I was I was very spoilers but. I quite liked it, uh, <laughs> um, which I think I've kind of given away anyway. But uh, but yeah, I uh, I thought it was a I thought it was a fantastic fantastic film. But yeah, lots of lots of bits of humor out there, but not because it could have been a very one note joke of a That's film. Right. It could That's have just right. been like, oh, guys having sex with a doll. <laughs> you know, it could have been that same kind of joke all all you know an hour and forty minutes of it, but it wasn't. It's something entirely different and. I do like having seen Barbie, which again is about dolls, and you know <laughs> Ryan Gosling in that and plays a doll himself, which ha- it has his having his own, you know, mental problems and struggles with another doll, you know, and his his own, you know, sometimes misogynistic energy comes yeah. out as well. Right. So yeah. so it's a it's a very I think given given this film and that film, I think there are there are a lot of similarities there, and I do I do recommend it. But yeah, I want to I want to talk a little bit about about the sex industry. We talked about the film. Yeah, sure. I think I think we've covered it. Unless there's anything else you want to say about the film, is there's anything else you want to mention? Scenes, characters, or anything else? Um, no, no. I think there was. A, I, I liked what you were saying there at the end about how the the whole town really dealing with um, uh, Bianca's decline and, and passing seriously. I, I love another scene. I really loved was. When the the old ducks of the town kind of come in and sit in the house while she is um in, in ill or in a hospital, and they say, "Oh, we bought casseroles." <laughs> and, yes. And oh, like, yeah. And they're just knitting and they're talking, and it's another like holding environment. It's another space for him to be able to talk. And um, you know, they say we sit, you know, we knit, and we're here, and that's what we do. And there's a lovely moment where he's like, he just feels, "Is this something I should be doing?" Like he's like gone from being a completely like isolated like hermit to wanting to like offer something to the group, and that was you know, a really touching moment. That's that was the last thing I really stood out to me. Yeah, yeah, I lo- I really love that scene. Again, it's very very wholesome, you know. And, and again, and again, they're they're there because they're they're in mourning, they're in grief, they're in you know. Again, 
they didn't have to be there. Again, it's at the end of the day, if we're talking in realistic terms, it's a doll. It's, yeah. you know, but for them, it, it was more than that. It was, and it was something else. And it goes to that thing that, yeah, like the, the imagination that you're kind of talking about before, what we put into the identities of like um, animate objects. Um, it makes me think about the criticism that people had of this film, or like as a fantasy. It's kind of like you look at the imagination in this film and you just wish people could have the imagination that this kind of world could exist. Mm. And it makes me think that uh, of a, an interview I saw with Ryan Gosling where he was asked about well, what made him choose this film. And he said he just loved the script. He loved the writer. He, he loved the script. And he loved the idea of a world brave enough to act like this. I, I love that. I love that. Yeah. I think Keanu Reeves said something like, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be live in a world that thinks kindness is a weakness. I think about, I think about that a lot, that quote, nice. but you know, I think, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Wonderful. Um, so, uh, I, I was doing a bit of digging. There was some, some interesting kind of rabbit holes in regards to, uh, to the sex doll industry and people who have sex dolls and what they're buying them for. Um, so the the global sex doll market in 2022 is valued at 411.2 million US dollars. By 2028, it will be uh, 644.9 US dollars, uh, million dollars. Uh, in 2028. So it is a booming industry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. It's, and I think it, I think it was triggered by COVID as well. I think sure. I think there were people living alone. There were people um, maybe their partners had passed away. People have dolls made in their partner in this image. Um, you know, as like you said, as a transitional object. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's their way of grieving. You know, and again, a lot of them aren't. You know, because I think they are asked questionnaires. A lot of these companies they don't just sell them. They don't just go here's a sex doll, off you go. You know, it's all customized and yeah. Yeah, exactly. They have to ask them a lot. What do you want? What do you want her expression to be? What kind of eyes does she have? You know, are they are they glazed over? Are they, you know, are they brown? Are they hazel? Are they slightly grey? You know, there's yeah. there's a lot of detail and time, but also I think they do psychological evaluations because okay. people who buy these have have some kind of need, some kind mm. of something yeah. there they are either they are lonely or they have difficulty maintaining relationships or you know they they don't have someone they can hold or they want they want to feel the weight of a, of a, of somebody on them or in bed with them or you know they want to, they want to hold someone or they want someone to talk to someone they can mm. express themselves with you know they can't you know and and like you said like get out those feelings and those and talk about it like a, a form of therapy you mm. know there's there's a lot of a lot of reasons why people would do this other than sex, don't get me wrong. There's people out there that will use, you know, sex mm. dolls for sex and you know all that sort of stuff. But I, I think there's there's deeper trauma that people are working through. Maybe even through that, maybe that helps them deal with something. Um, yeah. So I, I found that incredibly, incredibly interesting. There is some concerns about the sex doll industry um one, one of the rabbit holes i went down which i found was not true was that hitler had invented the first sex doll not true um but that it was that initial idea came from it was heinrich himmler was trying to stop his troops from getting the troops from getting like syphilis right so they were trying to come up with like other sex aids or things they yeah. could do and not you know contract horrific diseases there's there's you know there's some dodgier things like the sale of child sex dolls in japan right. uh, again again i know in japan the 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 age the the age for sexual kind of activity is 13 i believe i think that's the age of consent right. over there yeah i think it's quite quite young and that's why some of the some of the anime over here is a bit kind of problematic for right me. sure yeah, stuff. I don't know. Context, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's not. You know, it might seem. Oh, it's it's very creepy. But I kind of somewhat understand thing. that. But it's yeah. more. Yeah, it's more of a cultural thing. But yeah, but yeah. There's uh, there's also like you yeah. know the the trading of those. And again, there's there's you know fans out there of sex dolls which are which are hor horrifically misogynistic as well. There's there is a dark side to it. But uh, mm -hmm. again, it's. Mm -hmm. It's all kind of again. There's different shades shades to that. I'm oh, sorry. I, I watched a really interesting um, video uh, from Vice, I think, where this um, this journalist she was going around the industry and she went into a sex doll 
uh, factor. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Have you seen it? No, one? no, no, Richard, no, no. She was looking at predominantly at male sex dolls. Mm. I just said like something that was a bit of like the perceived minority in in that market, uh, and that was really fascinating um, to see the process of how they're all made and the 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 manufacturers talked about the clientele a bit, you know, that it breaks the shatters the kind of uh, cliches of mm. who it would be. Um, and one uh, she was trying to find clients of theirs that would talk, and obviously a lot of people were um, kind of reluctant to do that. One uh, who was a sex worker who um, did like camming and stuff like that uh, was obviously more open about talking about that type of stuff. She had a male sex doll and she said that um, she had a long distance relationship with her partner. And so she got this as a, you know, like a sex aid to mm. some of those things. Like you said, like um, feel the, um, the weight of someone and a bit of tactile thing when maybe she's. Um, you know, in contact with her partner. And she, she'd also said that she thought about uh, incorporating her sex doll into her work right. as a way of, like, like substituting a real guy. She's like, I don't have to pay him. You know, it's like less, less hassle with the, like, relationship dynamics and stuff like that. And yeah, it was just an interesting insight into what we wouldn't think was the normal client, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I read I read two uh, really interesting articles, which I will I will leave uh, in the show notes as well because I I think they're really quite fascinating and they're not they're not you know oh this is a disgusting filthy thing let's you know not do it but it's kind of quite a measured way of looking at both sides and you know mm-hmm. quite diplomatic. But um, in 2020, there were 29 published academic studies on sex dolls as well. So there's definitely something in the in the zeitgeist if you want to call oh, it yeah. that or yeah. in the milieu that's you know there's things going on there was even like um i think there was a yeah there was a study and they said that they wanted to um so in tw- here it is here i'll read it in 2023 study exploring the psychological characteristics and risk related cognitions of individuals who own sex dolls in the author's point of view that this is a concern that the sex doll ownership increases negative social as- attitudes towards women mm-hmm. and the risk of sexual offences however the study found no scientific evidence for this but rather that doll owners were less likely to commit sexually aggressive crimes and acts towards women the doll owners also tended to view women as unknowable and tended to have lower self-esteem which i think is quite interesting yeah that is very interesting and actually that makes me go back to what you were saying about the where there being like six dolls of children and mm. um so yeah it's a problematic conversation but i sure, make sure. me think about something i've read about pedophiles as like it was a, it was looking at like the pathologization of it and how though like a sex doll would be a way for a pedophile to kind of work that out without actually enacting it in yeah. the real world. So again, I like a lot of people are going to find that a really difficult idea to think about. Absolutely, it, it was, absolutely. It was, it was just an interesting thing. Yeah. yeah, when you're talking about it and so re- yeah, re- really... rehabilitating them in a sense, I guess. Yeah, but, uh, but, 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 but it's that split, like you're saying, between, like, does this thing exacerbate mm, um, negative social things or is it, like, um, kind of partitioning it from the world? But then mm-hmm. you get this whole thing about the, your, your inner world and your outer world splitting, and that's that's not helpful. Yeah. But yeah. It's, 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 re- it's really interesting what you say about the, the increase, and especially after the pandemic. I mean, uh, it makes sense that the, the, the industry is growing because, not only the thing with um, relationships and intimacy after something like the pandemic, you also have like the kind of uh, influx of AI and robotics and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So uh, yeah, it, make, it makes sense that something like yeah. this would be. I, I was literally, much. I was literally about to say. Um, so the emergence of sex dolls and robots has raised raised ethical concerns and sparked debates among scholars. Some argue that they promote sexist objectification and should not be developed or used at all. Others suggest that if desired uh, ethically, uh, if desired ethically, sex robots can have positive effects on individuals and social well-being. This would involve safeguarding advanced sentient robots with robo- robotic centric ethics, uh, robo centric ethics, uh, obtaining ex- explicit consent for sexual interaction. 
Despite these considerations, ethical questions surrounding robot prostitution remain unresolved and continue to fuel debate. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, yeah, sex work, the ethics around sex work and sex workers' rights is like a whole other conversation. Is, we yeah. have. Um, the, like these ideas we're talking about now could make for entire podcasts, even podcast series. <laughs> yeah, it's super, super interesting. But, you know, some of the criticisms here strike me as very similar to the criticisms around like heavy metal or video games. Yes. It's like, yeah. oh, you're going to do that? Then you're going to, you know, mm. be in the grass of state and then you're going to go on a killing spree or <laughs> something like that. It's like, it's a very, I don't want to say from a conservative as, like perspective on these things, mm. because really you need to be looking at the social sure. stuff that's going on. I think, on, I think right? you could say, I think you could say it's maybe a little alarmist, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, but again, it's it's one of those things you I, I think with these things you do have to keep an eye on them anyway. But yeah, I, sure. I I think, you know, and I think there's the you know, there's equal kind of valid arguments on both sides. But yeah, I think it's something that, you know, you don't necessarily again with the a, a, advancement of AI and and things like that, it's something we're currently navigating at the moment. You know, yeah. is it should it be used in art, should it not be used in art? How should it be used? You know, should it be copyrighted? I think they vote. I think somewhere in America they voted it can't be copyrighted or something like yeah. that. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but yeah, it's a it's a whole it's a whole nother kind of uh, kettle of fish. But I did I did find it interesting, and I'll I'll continue to go down this rabbit hole um, because I, I do find it quite quite an interesting. That's super topic. interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a, a lot of has a lot to do with kind of society. There's laws, religion, yeah. all kind of. In, you know, human interaction as well. Like, think about yeah. like, remember, like, well, like, Abba, like, their lives that have given their consent, but remember that, like, performance, that hologram of Tupac, where he's like yes. up there. Saying, I was going to say this. And so, yeah. So, like, you think, like, you're saying some people might use the doll as, like, in the image of their spouse, you know, mm. or their, partner, yeah, yeah. their deceased partner. Like, you bring in AI and all this type of stuff. Mm. All of a sudden, you get, you can get, like, their voice replicated and this type of thing. And it's, yeah, it's very interesting. Very it's, like, it's like that um, that Black Mirror episode with um, I think it was Haley Atwell was in it, and her partner right. dies, and they get yeah. she gets a robot of her partner. Exactly, exactly. and it's a very good, very good episode of Black Mirror. Um, and and yeah, but also like you know, people may have had you know serious kind of accidents or health problems, and they can't have sex anymore, but their partner right. still still loves them, still desires them, you know, and maybe that. That sex doll could be a substitute in that in that respect as well. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think, like you, like you say, you, you, there's valid arguments from both aspects, but you've also a little valid positive. You know, like you've got to have an open mind about this type of stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but yes, I think um, we can move on from that because again. We could go down a, a whole rabbit hole ourselves and we'll just start talking about it and we'll never, never, never stop. And we'll have to start a whole new podcast purely on sex dolls. Yeah. Uh, but um, I want to go on to the kind of the common criticisms that we've kind of sure. sort of talked about already. Um, yeah. So so we've talked about the it not being an accurate depiction of mental health uh, or, you know, the, the town taking it, you know, taking and continuing the you know quote unquote delusion you know it's not necessarily a delusion but uh we've talked about that and normalizing the use of sex dolls in public what would you think of that criticism yeah i mean in public that's uh that's a loaded thing really isn't it because that's dealing with people's attitudes to sex and intimacy uh behind closed doors or in public um again this 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 film treads a really clever line because it's not really she's not really bianca's not really sexualized very much at all so no. it's it's easier for us to say oh well it works in this in, uh, environment but um unfortunately our world's not quite that um rosy <laughs> no i guess so a little bit more complicated than that i think i don't have an easy answer for that um no, fair enough what do you think i think i mean people people have you know i've seen some some you know some mothers may have lost children and sometimes they will get a baby doll to to you know again as a transitional object as you've described you know is that is that any creepier mm -hmm. is that any is that any weirder any stranger i i mm -hmm. I, cu I couldn't really say i i think if they were i think if the, there's a if they're being used in a certain way i think yes very inappropriate because yeah know, 
that's that shouldn't be done even if with with your you know your human being in in public you know broad daylight Without shagging away in the town square or something yeah, yeah. just r- rutting in some some alleyway um while children walk by you know that's right that's, that's right that's not cool but i guess if you are you know if there's a reason for it and you know like we said we've talked about all these different potential scenarios where you would have a a doll in some form fair enough you know if you're going to do it that way but yeah i think if you're exposing yourself or mm. having doing sexual acts in public without you know it being guarded or walled or you know confined in some way or obscured from the public view yeah i don't think that's quite quite not quite quick it as we would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people say that the um, the sex doll it has a kind of an uncanny valley aspect. So it's kind of it's an object that looks human, but it really isn't human. So it kind of puts you off a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Would you? It would you... Me up because her, her, her eyes are always a bit like uh, sultry, but like like she's halfway through a sneeze. Like... <laughs> I mean that's an eighth of an orgasm, so surely <laughs> that counts, doesn't it? That's that's the thing. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm pretty sure I've never brought a woman to even an eighth of an orgasm. So <laughs> so, uh, so so a sneeze might be the my just, best. Just give her a route. sneeze. Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah, just make but... it get some pepper. Just, that's just right. stick some pepper up her nose. I'll do it. I'll just eight times, eight different times. We did it. Great job. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> But yeah, um, yeah, that's it's a weird of... criticism though because uh, it's the, that's the subject matter. It's a sex doll, so it's kind of it's, it's going to be that, right? It's going to be like sure. that. I mean, the characters react like that, don't they? The characters are acknowledging that they're creeped out and weird, and it's strange to them. It's unusual to them, and yeah. But but again, by the end, you but by the end, you are not. You are on board with Bianca. You're with Bianca. You believe in Bianca. Yeah. She has she has a life to her without having a life. But yeah. again, it's it's invested by Lars and all the other characters. Yeah. So so yeah, for me, it, it it wasn't something that bothered me because I knew again, like you said, you're going in knowing it's about a sex doll. So there's gonna be that aspect. If if it was if it came alive and was like you know in a dream sequence maybe or something like that, and, right. she was, and she was dancing around and talking, then I'd probably have an issue with it because she's animated, and I think that might take me out anyway. But I think the way. The way it works and the way they portray it in the film, I, I don't think it's an issue for me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it would have been odd had you come along, but you you just go with it. It's, yeah, it's funny, like you say, how how easily they and us as the audience get into it because then there's moments every now and then where they kind of remind us, like Bianca's in a in a hairdresser's chair and the hairdresser's there with two friends either side and they're discussing her hairstyle. Don't going to be like this? We'll do this and. They settle on something and the hairdresser's like, are you sure? <laughs> because once we cut it, it's not growing back. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll come back next week and we'll have this. Or, you know, and you're like, no, it's not not going to. I, I like those moments where the realism kind of sets in. They forget. Like, they're, yeah. they're, you know, they're having these flights of fantasy yeah. and they're going, yeah, we'll do this and we'll do this and we'll yeah. dress up like this. And when, this when, season... when Lars isn't around, you know, it's just them. <laughs> yeah. it's like, they're not exactly. doing it for his benefit. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That again, they're they they're involved. They're, it becomes their fantasy as well. It becomes their mm. you know shared. Delu- we'll call it a you know quote unquote shared delusion. But uh, but yeah, they're they're absolutely buying it. They're into it. So yeah, one hundred one hundred percent. Some of the other criticisms. Let's have a look. Um, long and uninteresting. People turn it off or fell asleep. No, I was I was really uh, hooked by. It. I, I mean, I was the the second time, but I'm trying to think the first time. I was really drawn in because mm. it's a really interesting character study in a social way as well. You know, it's not just a character study of Lars. It's a great one. But just like we've said kind of time and time again now, just how the how the town operates and, and deals with it. It drew me in. I, I wonder if someone found it boring and fell asleep and turned it off, what they might have been looking for, what they expected. Uh, I'll get into some of the uh, letterbox reviews I've found. I think some people were looking for a very different type of film <laughs> entirely. Um, you know, you know, no, no shame. But if, sure. if that's what you, if that's what you're into, fair play. Um, I completely disagree. I don't think it was long. I don't think it was uninteresting. I was not bored. I was totally hooked. You know, didn't pause it. Didn't get up from my seat. Watched the whole thing all the way through. So completely disagree with that with that argument. Um, weird and unlikable character. Uh, I'll say, I'll say my opinion on that. Completely disagree. Yeah. Completely disagree. One hundred percent. A little bit weird, but sure. I'm weird. weird aren't we, aren't we all? 
Weird's yeah, good. yeah, weird is good. Weird is good. Yeah, so yeah, weird is a positive adjective. Yes, weird is good, but yeah. uh, I, they were using it in a negative connotation. That's right. But uh, That's right. I disagree with that negative connotation. I think he is very likable. I think he is very He's relatable. Yeah, yeah. Very lovable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So people were saying it was part of a popular trend of two thousands quirky indie dramedies. Uh, I know these are the kind of films you're int- into generally. Mm. So mm. what do you, what do you think of this this trend? Do you, is, it, is it the the marvel of its day? Is it the fatigue of the the, the quirky mid two thousands dramedies? I'm trying to think of what what are some kind of parallels you might draw up. I'm thinking of like was it Garden State? Is that the one? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Um, it would Zach be Braff. one. Yeah, Zach Braff, mm-hmm. where it was this kind of like what what was that like a middle class malaise? Kind yeah, of, their commentary on the medicalization. Mm. um of the community and that um elizabeth elizabeth yeah. town that feels like something in that mm. vein yeah you know, i mean like, like it's difficult because i'm trying to think around that time i was i, I looked it up like 2007 what what was kind of going on what was i watching and you know you referenced with anderson before there was the darjeeling limited loads of my favorite directors yeah. um the cohen's had no country for old men fincher yeah, had great zodiac film. Um, Paul Thomas Anderson uh, had There Will Be Blood. So I was watching films like that that were kind mm. of like not super mainstream, but indie guys who had got up to the mainstream. Yeah. And it's funny because like you're saying about your mate who watches Wheels Anderson, I haven't watched loads of the Coens or Paul Thomas Anderson or Wheels Anderson's more recent stuff. Um, and I, I want to reflect on that somehow. But um, I was watching a mixture of those, that stuff. Uh, Death Proof was on that year. Yeah, good one. Um, American Gangster, Super Bad, in, Into the Wild. I was watching stuff like that. Um, uh, one parallel was I around that time, I'm not sure the exact year, but I watched The Station Agent. Have you ever seen that? No, I don't um, have heard of that one. It also has uh, Patricia Clarkson and it has uh, Peter Dinklage, which is oh, the nice. first film I saw him in. Um, and yeah, another kind of indie one where it's like, like a character study and i don't know i think that i reject this thing of like oh it's just a bloat of these things but that's because it's it's got heart and it's earnest and it's authentic and it and it touched me you know like there could be ones that are kind of saccharine and queer in a superficial way and this is not that so i don't buy it agreed agreed uh, and as we mentioned before a lot of people were disappointed that lars didn't have sex with bianca Total babe she was, so you know, <laughs> missed out, missed out. What, we wanted a very touching or loving sex scene that we never, never got. It's a very intimate moment, uh, which I'm I'm quite glad of. I don't know about mm-hmm. other people. Um, Maybe there's a sequel out there, some kind <laughs> of like Z grade sequel that they can find, I'm sure. I, I did, I did, um, I was doing a research last year for a, I, I didn't end, well, this year still. Well, I guess, no, it is, we're recording in 2023, but we're in 20, well, this is coming out in 2024, so it is this year still. So we did, a, we did. I was going to do a top five, like, creepy doll movies, and I did find mm. one, called, I think it's called Sex Object, and it's about a guy who gets a sex doll, but he, she whispers things to, for him to, like, kill people and do things. Oh. Yeah, so it's kind of like the opposite of this. Um, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, the shadow. Of food, so, yeah, so yeah I, I think it's called Sex Object, but I was going to watch it for preparation for that. We didn't we didn't end up doing the top five in the end. We merely just did one film, but it was good enough. Um, but yeah, that was one of the ones on the list. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll revisit that just as a kind of a, maybe a palate cleanse from, from Lars. Yeah. <laughs> not that I need it. Not that I need a palate cleanse. A, a palate something, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a, a, an palate an entree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> palate ruining, maybe. Uh, destroying. Um, but yeah, I, w- I was looking at the kind of reviews for this as well. So on Rotten mm-hmm. Tomatoes, it's got 80 one percent um fresh meter so it's fresh and then the audience score is 84 percent. so you know there's, there is a lot of criticism for it uh, metacritic has it at generally favorable at 70 on the meta score and then uh the user score is 7.8 and then letterbox it's a, an average of 3.8 so kind of a little lower but um but av- av- most people like it yeah, so, I think those seem pretty accurate because I, I agree it's not going to be for everybody, no. but it's touched enough people and it's probably converted a few people who probably thought that they weren't going to like it. So mm-hmm. that kind of three quarter mark is. I've, I've, I would definitely say I've had some preconceptions smashed. 
I'd say, mm. like, you know, with the sex dolls and sex doll industry and, and my preconceived notions. But I like that. I like having my mind changed and uh, altered in a good way, not by, you know, hallucinogenic drugs mm. or anything. Mm. But mm. I, I like having the opportunity to, you know, this is what this podcast is all about, is looking at, you know, things that are not mainstream, things that are not, you know, talked about or celebrated enough. And I think this film kind of falls right into that kind of that niche. Um, I'm going to read a few letterbox reviews and then we'll get on to some comments and then we'll finish up uh so let's have a look here's one so this is uh maxwell elliott he says two stars on letterbox he says unbelievably stupid a gradual progression from plausible to ridiculous full of em empty sentiment and injected with lethal doses of whimsy ah, i love that i mean i disagree but i love the uh I want the word whimsy and all its derivatives to be injected into life. Yeah. All of us. Yeah. Get it get it into yeah. my veins. I need more whimsy in my life. Get a bit more whimsy. Um, so uh, we've got Mim, Mim Bale, uh, two stars, too cute, cringy indie, but fascinating to watch. Gosling play romance to no one. To no one, yeah. That's an interesting way to put it. Um, I like how they... They, they thought it was fringe, but they were fascinated by it because cringe, the, the, like, you know, we're talking about Uncanny mm. Valley. There's an Uncanny Valley of fringe, isn't there? Yeah. Of absolutely. like where, where people brush up against it or they they reside exclusively in it or people can pass in and out. And this person was um, cringe curious. I yes. Think, yeah. yeah. <laughs> cringe adjacent. Uh, <laughs> here's another review from Danny with an I. Uh, two stars. Holy fuck. Boring. Jesus, he didn't even have sex with the doll. Kinda was betting on that. I thought it was going to be fun and sexy, but instead I cried. Ew. Oh, oh God. I need a palate cleanse after hearing that. That's <laughs> greasy. But 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 he came out of it and he he cried. So he had a he had, you know oh, he had an, there we go. You know yeah. he's he's he he was he said it was boring, but he seems to have like halfway through this review he seems to have gone yeah it was quite good actually. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, again, he was after something that, you know, totally unexpected. It wasn't right. what yeah. he expected. He had that smash. Yeah. And he cried because, or maybe maybe he's saying he cried because he didn't get what he wanted. I don't know. Can't. Well, yeah. He was going in and he got uh, an eye ejaculation and smeared. He was <laughs> leaking from the wrong end. Man. But, yeah. <laughs> Bodily fluids were shed, just not the ones he was hoping <laughs> for. <laughs> oh, dear. What else have we got here? <laughs> Uh, so this is uh, from uh, Kay Bethep. I um, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, it's got two stars, but it's also got a favourite on it as well. So a little mm. heart on there. So a lot of romanticization of some toxic mentalities and middling understanding of love and relationships. One really good bowling scene, though. <laughs> there was a twist. I wouldn't expect that. Wow, that's so interesting. I wonder what they considered to be toxic in that. Um, mm. Could be the town, maybe again, like that. Give it like you know, strengthening that delusion, going along with that's that right, yeah. quote unquote delusion, or maybe it's the Gus and his you know work colleagues, or maybe it's the colleagues mm. in the office. Maybe it's the idea of buying a sex doll in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Could be anything. To, to to going on, or maybe it was just that there wasn't enough bowling. That's it. The guy just wants more. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of bowling movies. Kingpin for one. You know, there's your there's your That's bowling right. movie if you need that. Um, but yeah, so there is that. Uh, let's have a look. Um, this is the one I sent to you actually. So this is from uh, Rue MCK. Roundhouse kick his stupid, creepy sex doll in the head. Send this twat to a psych ward. Absolute creep of a man. <laughs> I'm just stuck on the visualization of someone roundhouse kicking uh, a six. Oh. I, 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 I'm picturing Chuck Norris doing it. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got um, what's the space of uh, Quantum Leap with those uh, high rise jeans, he always ends up roundhouse kicking in his Levi's. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful imagery. I, I uh, just love how violently opposed to this film people have got. It's, yeah, really strong reactions. Yeah, I know. It's just like, oh, you know, they've, they've gone in. Um, so speaking of hype, this one mentions hype. So uh, this is uh, Tim Pritchard. He says it's a one and a half star review. He says, forget the hype. This is utterly bland. I wouldn't have sat through it at all had I not been cleaning out my keyboard one key at a time. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, some people are 
very, very upset by this one. <laughs> it's it's like it's like forced to watch it. Like it's it's really interesting the 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 what how people are reviewing these things and they're so reluctant to have watched the film, but they 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 felt like maybe this is the best thing about it for them is that they had to bring in a review about roundhouse kicks or yeah exactly oh. yeah they've got they've got a lot to deal with themselves I think um i'll do i'll do a couple more um so uh one star from damien he says my childhood died the day i saw this movie two out of ten flashlights (laughs) and in what way do you think he's talking about because his childhood died Um, because been introduced to sex dolls or because his view of sex dolls has now been changed maybe maybe it would remind the whole ryan gosling thing reminded him too much of himself or his family dynamic his childhood yeah, yeah. maybe i don't know um i'll do one more and we'll get on some listener comments uh so, uh, uh one star review from km uh, eston eston uh pretty sure that if our hero were anything but a white cis male this town would have burned him as a witch. Honky superpowers activate. Yeah, I mean that's a fair criticism, I think. <laughs> <laughs> fair point. Fair point. Uh, he's also um, <laughs> P.S. He says if they decide to remake it as Lars von Trier and the real girl, I'm down for a rewatch. <laughs> I think that might be Spider Dan's next VHS pick. <laughs> <laughs> now, now it is. Now it is. <laughs> Oh, right. Well, um, before we get onto listed comments, I'll just quickly go over my opinion of the film. Again, like I said earlier, I think it's wonderful. I think it's great as a heart. Again, smash some preconceptions I had. I I, I was concerned for Bianca. I, I cared for Bianca by the end of the film, and I didn't think I would at the beginning. Um, and I think, again, it's like we talked about sidesteps all the sexy stuff quite quickly, all the creepier, dirtier elements. Um, but but generally, I I... I actually really related to Lars in a lot of ways. Like, uh, I live alone. I, you know, I'm, I'm in therapy at the moment. I'm, you know, I'm dealing with some stuff, and there's a lot of kind of similarities there. You know, I've had problems with the relationships and maintaining them, or living with people, or, you know, there was one point I didn't want to be touched physically. There was there was a point in my life that 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 just wasn't right for me or or somebody noticed that in me and i i realized that in myself um so so i i actually found it quite again i'm not going to go out and buy a sex doll i'm not quite lars but i can see why someone would get one i can see what need and desire they have to 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 buy something like that and to require it for their own sanity and their own mental health. So uh, on a on a personal level, I I thought this was um, a very very relatable film in in so many ways. Mm. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. No problem. No problem. Uh, so we do have some listener comments. I've asked generally what they think of the film. I've also asked if they have any quirky indie films they want to talk about or mention. Uh, and just general thoughts on sex dolls, owners, or the industry. So Janine Douglas on Facebook, she mentions Six String Samurai, which is kind of an indie post-apocalyptic film where a guy has a guitar and he has to go to like Elvis's, I think he needs to get to Graceland, but he's dressed as Buddy Holly. So it's a very, very odd film, but uh, enjoyable if that's what you're looking for. Uh, so we have uh, we have that. She says, best weird film, and it feels like something kind of a precursor to Fallout, Fever Dream, whilst emulating Lone Wolf and Cub, and a banging soundtrack by the Red Elvises too. Have you seen that one? No, but it sounds very interesting, yeah. <laughs> it is interesting. Um, Cinephile Honey on uh, Instagram, she says absolutely love the film and personally i find it to be an excellent representation of autism and the loneliness that comes with it i know they don't explicitly say state that lars is autistic but he definitely has a load of traits i found the film so heartwarming yet heartbreaking at the exact same time you know what that that sort of makes me think about something you were saying in, uh before where yeah i really care for bianca you really care for it but there's that complicated thing where you know she has to die you know you know she has to go so that have that that kind of conflicting feelings mm. um given to us or, or manifested in us and so it's really interesting and strong 
Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so Max Byrne on Discord, he says, I don't think I could have sex with a doll per se, but I wouldn't knock anybody else who does. Uh, Tony Farina, he says, I have no thoughts on the sex doll industry, but I would say that this movie is way ahead of its time. I think it was commenting on the isolation boom that happened when the internet became ubiquitous, which in 2007, it wasn't. Stories of isolation are not that unique, but I love how artists uh, find new ways to explore it and remind us to be careful of it. There is a difference between being alone and being lonely. This movie clearly shows us that. We don't get the movie Her without this. I personally think Lars was a better film than that as well. Mm, yeah, no, I agree 100% with Tony. And that's no surprise. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, have, I, 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 I was thinking that as well when I was watching. I was like, this is way ahead of its time. Like this was like, like it almost feels light years ahead of its time almost. Yeah, and it's, it's a really great setting being in that kind of small Midwest of the town because it's a bit of a bubble in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm sure there's probably towns that exist exactly like that today, but Tony's commentary on the way that the internet has changed our culture is, yeah, really spot on. Wonderful. Yeah, and like you said, isolation, which again is probably due to this co this boom in the industry due to COVID and the isolation we were all under. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, Mike Burton of Genuine Chit Chat, Literally never heard of the film. He's never heard of any films. Mike. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. It's like if, if it's not if it doesn't begin with with S uh, or it doesn't begin <laughs> with star, he's probably not heard of it. But here we go. Uh, so he literally never heard of the film. Only sex doll stuff I've seen is from a cheesy eighties nineties teen comedy movies. Uh, they're almost solely used as cheap jokes i think sex dolls should be allowed but i'm fairly open to the vast majority of things being legal and letting adults make their own decision so long as it doesn't hurt others i think when you get into the realm of sex dolls uh, of things uh, other adults women and men uh, the realm of sex dolls of of things other than adult women uh, and men right that's what he's saying yeah he's, he, um it gets into some very complicated territory which we've discussed um, which I'm not educated enough to delve into, especially not via a message. Uh, thanks, Mike. Though, and and we're not we're not going to delve into it too much in this podcast either. But we've mentioned it at the very least. Uh, Math, um, he said, maybe Mike, it's a podcast for the making, which I've said. Uh, however. Uh, we can also hear you telling Megan, no, really, I'm ringing up to ask about the sex dolls if someone wants to be interviewed. I'm sure Megan won't think that's weird at all. She she doesn't think anything's weird. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then John Hammond, he says, like Mike, never heard of this one. And like Tony, no thoughts on the sex doll industry, each to their own for me. Although, being an Only Fools fan, does this count? And he sent her a gif of a sex doll being used to scare, I think it was Uncle Albert or Grandad in Only Fools. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, maybe, maybe. But yes, that is it. So is there anything else you'd like to say before we finish, Blake? No, no, I think we've, we've gone through quite a lot here. Um, we have. Yeah, we really, have. really happy with it. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for introducing this to me again. Something a little off kilter, a little different for me um, in kind of the stuff we look at. But that's what this year is all about. I'm going to experience a lot of things uh, or re-experience re things um, that, you know, we've not really done on the podcast before. Or, um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting. We'll see what the de the guests bring out this year and and see what the Patreon choose. But it's going to be it's going to be an interesting year. Uh, but, Blake, apart from that lovely VHS podcast about uh, bad boy bubby um where can where can people find you on the internet or look at the stuff you're up to yeah thanks um yeah so i feature um occasionally on the comics and motion podcast and various episodes uh you can find me on it at blake biles b-y-l-e-s and uh, i have a youtube channel as well under the same name i believe um with some a few video essays and things like that Amazing, amazing. Well, as always, you can find me at spiderdownandthesecretballs.com. Don't forget to use the hashtag prepare for prattle when you interact with us. And please subscribe to the Pop Culture Collective newsletter uh, to find out what myself, Comics in Motion, and all the other related podcasts are up to week by week. I'd like to thank my patrons on Patreon for choosing this episode. I am Jack's Musing, Simon Cotton, Paul Mellon, Mike Burton, Angry Andy, Tonya Todd, Tony Farina, Math, Scott Hodgson, and Rhea Carey. Uh, I can't say her name today. Rhea Carrigan. Uh, for their continuing donations, it is very much appreciated and helps Prattle World keep on turning. And if you ever find yourself in a position to help the podcast, 
please consider it. Uh, thank you, Blake. I think this is an absolute banger to start the year with, so I really appreciate you suggesting this. And this is also going to be on the uh, the VHS Strikes Back are covering this as well as their next uh, late fees. So oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, so the the next late fees they do will be Lars and the Real Girl. So I'm, I'm quite looking forward to hear what uh, oh, yeah. Dave, Dave and Chris think of this one. Um, I'm sure we'll get some interesting anecdote from uh from chris i'm sure there's something he can relate it back to um that's why we keep coming back <laughs> it's that that i'm sure that i mean that's a I, I think he said he's got adhd so that's kind of like another level of, of relating every single story or everything he can back to to that one time he did a wank um <laughs> it's incredible it's uh, and, and again it's one of the most entertaining parts of the podcast for me anyway <laughs> Uh, but yeah, thank you, Blake. This has been wonderful. I know it's been a bit of a nightmare to organise with with everything, and uh, you've got a lot going on. I know you're going on holiday as well, which is why we're doing it in 2023 as opposed to 2024. Um, but yeah, no, I've I've had an absolute blast discussing this with you, and uh, I'm hoping to hear a lot more from you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been an honour to be here and just kick off 2024 with you and uh, with such a great film. And I'm really glad that you liked it. I did. It's- I really, really did. Very, very happy. Right, uh, right. Well, that'll be it for us. And um, and next up, we will be looking at oh, Candyman. Candyman's coming back uh, with uh, with Sarah next week. Uh, not next week, in two weeks. Uh, but yeah, that's that's going to be a nice uh, a bit. That's going to be a palate cleanse in, uh, cleanse in itself. Yeah. Uh, but there'll be, I'm sure, there'll be a lot of issues and things discussed in that film as well. So uh, I'm looking forward to that one as well. But thank you, everyone. And as always, prepare for prattle. Thank you.